Hey biologist, Mr. Fott here. Today, we're gonna to be talking about the properties of lipids. First up are the must knows. So we were talking about the differences in saturation and how they determine the structure and function of our lipids. We'll also be discussing phospholipids and how they contain polar regions that are going to interact with other polar molecules such as water. And they have nonpolar regions that are often considered hydrophobic and will interact with those sorts of molecules. To break down lipids, we would need to classify the three main categories of lipids that we are going to be investigating throughout this course. First up are fats, also known as triglycerides. The main function of these is that they're going to store energy. Now think about when we store fat in our body here, is that when we eat a lot and our body can't process all the energy at once, and so what it needs to do is instead of just expending all of that energy all at once, it will then store it as these fat molecules, i.e. triglycerides, so that if we ever need to use that energy later down the road, that we have these stored reserves, i.e. fat. Now, this also plays into if you ever want to lose fat or body fat, then you need to do exercise. You need to use the energy, and that is going to be the only surefire way in which your body is going to then burn off the fat or lose the fat you need to then use that stored energy. These fat molecules are made up of two parts, glyceride, or sorry, glycerol and three fatty acids. We'll take a look at an example in just a moment. We'll also discuss saturated, unsaturated, and polyunsaturated and what it means this whole saturated business. Next cl classification are steroids. Two main categories are going to be cholesterol, that's the very first and popular example, as well as hormones. We'll take a look at a few examples of those. Third category are going to be phospholipids. This is uh, going to play a role into when we're talking about membranes, specifically cell membranes is going to be a huge portion, but also other multi-layered membrane systems as well, as we'll talk about these phospholipids. To break down a phospholipid, it's made up of two components. It has a hydrophilic head and hydrophobic tail. Now, regarding the wording, keep in mind, hydro refers to water, philic or phyle means attractive to, and phobic or phobia means water fearing or repulsion. And so the head portion is going to be attracted to water, whereas the tail portion is going to be repelling water or has a phobia of water. Here's an example of how we could then create our triglyceride, for instance. So it's still going to do the dehydration synthesis. So we need to remove the water, that's the dehydration portion. We're going to take one hydrogen and the OH or hydroxide from the uh, glycerol and the fatty acid. This happens to be what's called palmitic acid, as we can see here. Once you remove the water, let the reaction carry to completion, and now you form what's called an ester linkage. Think back to the functional groups, the ester functional group, carbon, double bonded oxygen with a single bonded oxygen to the side of it, this is going to represent the ester and how we can remember this is an ester linkage. Now we take a look at this, the fatty acid portion of this, notice all the molecules or rather atoms that are inside them. So we can see carbons and hydrogens and carbons and hydrogens and carbons and hydrogens. That kind of goes on for a while. And if you look at the bottom, the fat molecules, all three of those, those three fatty acids, they all have a similar composition. They're all towards the end portions of it are going to be composed of carbons and hydrogens. Now think back, how many hydrogen bonding portions are there going to be if they're all carbons and hydrogens? There's no N's for nitrogens, there's no O's for oxygens, there's no F's for fluorines, and there's certainly no S's for sulfurs. So we don't see those top four molecules to indicate that it's going to do some of the hydrogen bonding, which means that the whole right-hand portion, all the carbons and hydrogens, is going to be high, uh, like sincerely hydro phobic and it has water fearing portion. So that's the part that's going to want to repel water. And this is where we get our hydrophobic uh, properties of when we look at not just fat molecules, but also lipids and oils as well. Speaking of lipids and oils, let's talk about saturation and what this actually means. To be saturated with something, it means like doused with. Imagine if you had like a washcloth and it were dry then you would dip it into a bucket of water or a bath or something, and then it would become saturated and fully absorbed with all those water molecules. So saturated just simply means like fully encased with or doused with, if you will. And so what we're being fully encased or saturated with or doused with is specifically hydrogens. So if something is saturated, it has every single possible hydrogen that could possibly exist in that formula.
which means there are no double bonds, there are no triple bonds, it is completely a straight line, no little kinks in the chain as what we can see compared to our unsaturated fats. So at our examples at the top, we see steric acid and we see the gray spheres and the black spheres. The black ones are the carbons, the gray ones are the hydrogens. Red does happen to represent oxygen, but there's not very many of those. It's mostly composed of carbons and hydrogens. So for steric acid, we can see straight line, which means no double or triple bonds, and it has every single possible hydrogen, i.e. it is fully saturated. Now the examples would be like butter and lard. These, generally speaking, are going to be coming from animal byproducts, and if we're to leave them out at room temperature, they become solid. Now if we look at the opposite side, when we start to have unsaturated, we mean it is not fully encased or doused with all of the hydrogens. We've had to remove a couple because now there's a double bond. So our oleic acid is a good example of this, in which now we have like a bend in this, in this molecule, and that bend is caused from the double bond that exists there. Now these, generally speaking, these unsaturated fats or oils are going to come from plants. These are going to typically be liquid at room temperature. Some great examples would be corn oil or olive oil. Uh, so these are going to be mostly cooking products. I mean, all of these are generally cooking products. Um, but think about which ones you would want to more so ingest. Things that are solid at room temperature or things that are liquid at room temperature. Now keep in mind that all of these will eventually be absorbed into your bloodstream, which means going through your veins and arteries, and potentially leading to clogged arteries um, if it's more on the saturated part. And so this is where we have to be careful about what, uh, what amounts of saturated fats we have in our diet. And you should technically be, uh, be cooking with unsaturated fats, i.e. oils. So it's strongly encouraged that you cook with extra virgin olive oil, for instance, um, would be a great example. Now, cholesterol, this is an interesting one. Now, I know it's, we talked about this in class, but I'll reiterate. This top molecule is what's known as cholesterol. And so we do find these typically with alongside like saturated fats, so like butter, lard, those types of things, animal byproducts. Um, it is considered a steroid, not the kind that you inject to get bigger or anything. Um, that's not what we're talking about. Um, but cholesterol is a precursor to a number of other hormones, i.e. other steroids. So if you look at the bottom, there are six common examples cortisol, corti uh, corticosteroid, uh, aldosterone, testosterone, beta estradiol, and progesterone. Notice how the similar uh, structures of them, in which they have the four ringed structures, three of which are going to be hexagons and one pentagon. This is a typical fashion for each of our steroid kind of compounds, is that they have this type of structure. However, notice the subtle differences between these. This is something that, as I'm going to mention frequently, do not memorize. These are types of molecules that AP would present to you and just ask you questions about. Last, we're going to talk about the phospholipids. So if we look at this, we can see the hydrophilic portion and the hydrophobic portions. And it's indicated on the left-hand side. Keep in mind that the little zigzags at each one of those vertices or the points at which the two lines intersect with one another is a carbon and then the extra bonds that are not represented are going to be hydrogens. So these little zigzaggy lines uh, on the left-hand side, this is the structural formula, um, those are gonna be carbons and hydrogens, much like our fatty acids that we saw previously. At the top, it's a little more complicated. This is another one of those things, please do not memorize, um, but what they're pointing out here specifically is this phosphate group. So notice, it's surrounded by four oxygens, and at the top, there's even with the choline, is a nitrogen up there too. And those are the atoms we're looking for to indicate hydrogen bonding, i.e. hydrophilic portions. Last, let's look at an example of some of these phospholipids. So we have kind of a cartoony version on the left, and a more realistic version is indicated by an electron microscope on the right. So in water, and specifically like vinaigrettes, they form what's called these micelles, is how you pronounce that. Uh, and these hydrophilic heads and the hydrophobic tails will actually form these spherical ball-looking structures called micelles, and they'll actually trap particles on the inside. This is generally how vinaigrettes work, as well as if you're using soap and things, they form these little bubbles around the, the particles, whether they're hydrophilic or hydrophobic portions, to help dissolve them and wash things away. Down at the bottom, here's our phospholipid bilayer, as indicated by like a cell membrane, which we're gonna come back to very frequently as we talk more about cells. 
The image on the right does a pretty good job kind of showing the hydrophilic portion that's towards the top and the hydrophobic tail as you can see as the long strands down below. Thank you all for watching. Please let me know if you have any more questions.